Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 153. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and I'm back with another new episode for this September 2018. And today you're going to hear my interview with Natita Gassell. This is our second time talking, and we are talking today about trauma-informed practice and staying within the scope of practice. I think Many of us, whether we are therapists or if we are non-professionals who are out there in the world, sometimes we aren't really clear on what somebody's role is if they are kind of presenting themselves as a helper or healing professional. We don't always realize the difference between someone who's a licensed mental health professional and someone who has a great intuition and willingness to help, but may not really know enough about trauma to even realize the harm that they could inadvertently do by attempting to help people who are trauma survivors. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started with my interview with Natita Gassell. Therapy Chat Podcast wouldn't exist without the support of its listeners. If you'd like to become a member, please go to patreon.com slash therapy chat. By making a $1 per month donation, you can help Therapy Chat keep going over the long haul. Thank you for your support. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today, I am really happy that I'm talking with someone who was a recent guest on Therapy Chat, and we are coming back together to go deeper into some topics that came up last time. So welcome back to Natita Gassell. Natita, thanks so much for coming back to Therapy Chat today. Of course, Laura. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, I'm so glad we could do this. You know, when we were talking before about trauma-informed yoga and your method, the trauma-conscious yoga method. Mm -hmm. You know, we we kind of a little bit in our conversation and a lot before and after we talked about like trauma informed practice as mental health clinicians and as in the work doing yoga therapy Mm -hmm. and for you as a yoga teacher. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the scope of practice and how those things can be kind of confusing. So I thought it would be great to kind of just talk more about that on the podcast and let our audience kind of consider some of the things that we were percolating. Yeah, that sounds great. I'd love to dive deeper today. And, you know, it's a really rich subject and trauma is very complex. So I think it's valuable to have a second session uh, related to this today. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just start off, though, for anybody who might have missed our first episode, and I'll be sure to post a link to that with this. Let's have you talk a little bit about yourself and just kind of introduce yourself to our audience again for anyone who didn't get it the first time. Sure. Yeah. So my name is Natita Cassell, as you shared. I'm located in Austin, Texas. I've been here for coming up on three years. And before that, I taught yoga and practiced as a therapist in New York City, where I lived for nine years. So it was a big shift. I am loving Austin. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) The weather is so much nicer. Yeah. And so I have a private practice here called Mind Body Psychotherapy. And my, my specialty is integrating psychotherapeutic yoga, and more specifically, trauma conscious yoga into talk therapy and other more somatic-based psychotherapies. And so I specialize in working with trauma survivors. 
And then the other thing I do with my time professionally is that I lead trauma conscious yoga teacher trainings. So I developed something called the trauma conscious yoga method, which is a style of trauma informed yoga that integrates trauma informed yoga with more somatic psychotherapy principles borrowed from EMDR, internal family systems, somatic experiencing. And so It's a a very clinical focused trauma informed yoga teacher training that's 25 hours and it's geared towards mental health clinicians, but also yoga teachers attend, health coaches and life coaches attend, body workers attend. And we'll get into this, but because, you know, of the nature of these trainings, I'm talking to a diverse group of people who have varying scopes of practice. So that's something that that comes up that we'll get into scope of practice and trauma informed work. But but yeah, that's how I spend the other part of my time is leading those trainings. Um, Been teaching yoga for 13 years and taught yoga first before becoming a therapist, but always knew I wanted to take the therapy path. So I find that therapy and yoga really complement one another. They're not replacements for one another, but they are a beautiful balance to one another and helping support someone's healing and growth. Yeah. So thank you so much for explaining that. And I have to shout out how we both attended Old Dominion University in Virginia. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> we probably were almost overlapping at some yeah. point, but we didn't know each other then, but we made that connection now. So, yeah. So I was I was thinking it would be great for us to kind of touch on the two perspectives about what trauma informed work can be. You have the four R's and then Mm -hmm. there's another list that's six principles of of trauma informed practice. So can, can you kind of go over the four R's first? Sure. Yeah. So the four R's I have here as outlined by the National Center for Trauma-Informed Care. And this is going to be a summary, not written exactly as they have it on their website. But one is that trauma-informed care realizes the broad impact of trauma and the process of recovery. So basically that alludes to there being care where there is an in-depth understanding of what trauma is, the various uh, experiences that constitute trauma, how it manifests in the mind, body, and spirit, and what is most supportive to helping someone resolve their trauma. So that was one. (laughs) (laughs) The second one is that trauma-informed care recognizes the signs and symptoms. And so a lot of the times the signs and symptoms of someone who might be experiencing trauma, they're, you know, they're not so explicit or obvious, especially if you're looking at a child that, that, you know, um, a lot of these things might go undetected. So we'll get into that more, I'm sure. But, you know, care that really understands how to detect and, and notice the nuances of things that could be clues or hints that trauma could be going on. Thirdly, trauma-informed care responds by creating and integrating practices and policies. So it's not just that we have this knowledge, but we're proactively doing something to support the recovery of trauma survivors. We're creating programs and trainings and new methods of therapy, for example. And then lastly, and this one's super important, um, trauma-informed care seeks to actively resist re-traumatization. So there is an understanding of the potentiality to do harm while working with trauma survivors. And there's an understanding of what practices we can adopt as professionals to really minimize the likelihood that we will re-traumatize someone. Okay. So thank you so much for going over that because that there is a mouthful. And I mean, (laughs) it's... The last part is, I think we should start with the last part. Sure. Yeah. It's it's so crucial. And this is something that I think whether you are a person who has experienced trauma and you may be in therapy at some point, or if you're a therapist, or if you're a yoga teacher or a yoga, Mm -hmm. you know, yoga practitioner, a yogi, 
we all need to understand this about re-traumatization because this is the part that I think is the hardest to see and notice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, we could probably talk about this point alone for three hours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you just tell me when to stop. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'd love to go in to this further. Yeah. So I think, I mean, first of all, I think what people, everything about the list that you just read is really helpful because understanding when trauma is activated is something that a well-trained trauma clinician or a person who has maybe a yoga teacher who has experience in recognizing the symptoms of trauma would know that the person who's experiencing the trauma may not recognize in the moment because they are, their trauma is activated. And so their thinking Mm -hmm. and, you know, observing self is kind of not online depending on, you know, how triggered they are. So, you know, and I've, felt that myself. So I know Mm -hmm. what it's like when you're reacting and it feels right in the moment, Mm -hmm. but later you're like, why did I react that way? Yeah. And then you look back and you go, oh my gosh, I was triggered. Mm -hmm. That's what was happening there. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if, if one doesn't know that that's happening, if the person who it's happening to doesn't know and the professional who is working with them doesn't know there's a lot of harm that can come from continuing to work with that person in their emotional process while their trauma is activated. Definitely. Definitely. And, you know, even to add on to that, you know, sometimes people don't even know that they've experienced trauma. I think in the general population, there still isn't um, the ideal, what I would say would be the ideal amount of knowledge circulating mm-hmm. around what constitutes trauma. So I have clients, you know, I it's up there on my website for my private practice that I specialize in trauma. And so I'm having clients come in who I'm thinking they know that they have trauma. <laughs> but then right. When I talk, you know, they actually just came for another reason. And then, you know, I'm calling what they're telling me trauma. And they're like, trauma? I didn't know I had trauma. So one is that people you know, need to be trauma informed so that they even have an understanding of what trauma is. And, you know, if a client or a a yoga student or whatever doesn't necessarily know that they're triggered, they might also not even know that they're having a trauma reaction at all. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so the person who might be working with them, whether it's a yoga teacher or clinician um, or a, a coach or energy worker may have asked the person, Have you experienced any trauma? And many of us think as clinicians, well, I asked them if there was any history of trauma and they Mm -hmm. said, no, it's not Mm -hmm. that simple. No. Yeah. So maybe we should go over what trauma is and not assume, because I know there's a diverse audience that listens to your podcast and we shouldn't assume that people know what trauma is. Maybe we should just go into it briefly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so (laughs) sure. (laughs) And I'll try to make it brief, you know, but sometimes we'll call these big T versus little T trauma. And I find that the things that we consider to be big T trauma are the experiences that most people do recognize as traumatic. So most people understand that war constitutes a traumatic experience, that natural disaster, earthquakes and things like that, fires constitute a traumatic experience. And, you know, trigger, I forgot to give the trigger warning. So let me just pause for a moment because I always feel like it's important to give the trigger trigger warning better late than never. Mm -hmm. You know, and when talking about trauma, there is the potential to be triggered for conscious material or unconscious material to come up to the surface and for one to experience an immense, immense amount of discomfort. So to the listeners out there, I really encourage you to take care of yourselves and even take a break from listening if you need to in order to really support your emotional needs. So that that's the, the trigger warning. So back to big T trauma, again, incidents like rape, you know, being held at the gunpoint, most people recognize, okay, those are traumatic experiences. Car accident, plane crash, Car accident, flood. Yeah. Physical abuse, childhood sexual abuse, yeah. Those things that, you know, they're not necessarily single incident, but those mm-hmm. things that have a kind of a more definitive 
beginning and end, those are the, the big T traumas. And what most people recognize is, okay, that's traumatic. Now, little T traumas are things that oftentimes go undetected under the radar that most people don't necessarily know are trauma. So these are ongoing experiences like discrimination based on one's race, ethnicity, or sexual preference, or even like religion. Yeah. Gender. Growing up in a family where you were the middle child and so you didn't get attention you know you you felt left out and like you didn't have a safe support from your caregivers and emotional neglect has an incredible incredible impact Mm -hmm. um you know a lot of people will say i had a great childhood my parents were amazing they gave me everything i needed we went on trips and i played sports and all these things but you you dive a little bit deeper and you you learn that their parents didn't really allow them to feel their feelings. Um, they were called dramatic for having feelings or, you know, they weren't allowed to cry or, you know, they were only given attention and praise if they quote end quote did something good. Mm-hmm. Right. So they had to earn the love by getting an A or earn the love by being chosen to be the lead in the school play. They had to do something. And it's really important for a child to to be to sense that they are unconditionally loved and accepted simply for being the child that they are. So when that doesn't happen, there's a lot of shame that children experience that carries on out into adulthood. And that's what I see really, you know, very often in my practice is these little T traumas, this emotional neglect um, that people don't realize is trauma that impacts one's nervous system the same way as the big T traumas. Yeah. 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 And also having a parent who is an alcoholic. um, Yeah. Having one one parent be abused by the other parent, even if Mm -hmm. you weren't seeing the abuse happen or you were not being threatened with the abuse, just having that environment. Mm -hmm. And also if your parent was depressed, many things like that, losing a parent at that would be big T, right? Losing a parent would be big T. Yeah, you know, traumatic e- events can be directly experienced, like it happens to you. It can be witnessed. So you witness the traumatic experience happening to someone else, but it's still impacting your nervous system just the same. Yeah. Or you learn about, you know, especially if you learn about a, a loved one experiencing a traumatic event that can create trauma in your nervous system. And then for a lot of us who are listening to this podcast, vicarious trauma. So Mm -hmm. being so closely connected to the details of a traumatic incident, either because you're a therapist or you're a first responder or whatever the case may be, that you actually take on that trauma in your own uh, mind, body and spirit. So, so yeah, so that's like an overview of so again, it's it's really complex and it's more than like natural disaster and war that yeah. we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And I must add that I speak with many, 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 many people who have experienced some type of sexual assault or rape that they don't yeah. know would fit under that definition. So mm-hmm. they don't think that they've experienced anything traumatic. And so it's not just that they don't that they know that rape is traumatic, but they think they haven't been raped. But when they tell you that there was an unwanted sexual experience that does fall Mm -hmm. under the definition of rape and they're having this trauma response that matches up with that traumatic experience, you know, so someone may not recognize it and they'll say, well, I knew that happened and I didn't want it and it was awful. And I was in a very bad place for a long time after it happened. And I still think about it all the time, but Mm -hmm. I didn't know that was a trauma. So. Right. Yeah. Thank you for adding that. That's really important. And I think part of that too, is that there's lack of understanding around what, what is consent, you know? Yes. And consent has to be, you know, consistent. So not just once, but consistent and enthusiastic. Yes. You know, right. Freely Uh, given. Yes. Freely given without coercion. Yeah. And again, that's a whole nother topic. But yeah, thank you for for, for adding that one, because that's I, that's very common in my practice, too. And also, you know, part of it is protective 
right? If, if yep. you decide that it was rape or sexual assault, then you admit that it happened. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. if you if you admit that to yourself, then that feels worse somehow. So there's a protective function of keeping you unaware, but then it's still mm-hmm. affecting you. And so that's why. Exactly. Yeah. And that can lead to a lot of shame. Why am I? People think they're going crazy. You know, they use yep. that like la- they use that language. Why am I going crazy? Why can't I get it together? Right. Because yeah. You've experienced something that was highly traumatic for your, your mind and body, but you're just not connected to it because, you know, there's a part of you that's protecting you from that. So information, I feel like information and education is so important and is another big part of trauma-informed care. We cannot inform pe- people enough. If we have the information, we can't be the secret holders of it. We've got to give that information out because you know, we've all heard that knowledge is power, right? But it really, it truly is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really empowering to give people the information. And then that also helps to minimize the power differential, which is another big thing in trauma-informed care. So yes. should we go to resist re-traumatization? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> so once you who are listening understand that even if someone doesn't identify as having trauma doesn't mean that it that they haven't experience trauma, they're not affected by it, Um, then how do you actively resist re-traumatizing that person when you're working with them? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So now everybody who's listening has some more information if they didn't already. So that's one step working for them um, against resisting re-traumatization. But I think we should talk about vulnerability a little bit um, and how vulnerability relates to trauma, especially acute trauma in a very specific way. So, so for example, Laura, like you and I have the luxury of choosing when we want to get vulnerable and how we want to get vulnerable and open up and with who we want to get vulnerable. And we can create boundaries because of the inner work we've done and the training we have to know how to not get vulnerable with people who aren't safe to be vulnerable with. So that that is an amazing, powerful thing to, to have. Trauma survivors, acute trauma, meaning it happened in the very recent past, and they're experiencing what we call the re-experiencing symptoms, which are things like flashbacks, nightmares, intrusive thoughts, and intrusive images. When one has these re-experiencing symptoms, which are very common to the trauma survivor experience, one is getting vulnerable outside of their volition. So it's like the body is being hijacked and brought back into that experience. And when one is re-experiencing and having the flashback or having the intrusive image, it's really felt like it's happening again in the present. It people believe it's really happening again. So you can imagine how uncomfortable and how terrifying that can be. And so people who have re-experiencing symptoms, they don't have that luxury of, you know, choosing when they're going to get vulnerable. And I'm going to put this in the context of an example with, I'm going to use yoga teachers as an example. Perfect. Great. So I love yoga teachers. Those are my people. (laughs) And, you know, a lot of yoga teachers have this beautiful gift of just being these these lovely, bright, radiant souls that draw other people in just by the nature of who they are. Um, You know, they're like these bright, shining lights and they teach these beautifully um, sequenced and articulated yoga classes and offer words that are very healing and help to create aha moments in their students' minds. And, you know, there's some yoga teachers that are just absolutely incredible at what they do. And, you know, yoga can feel like therapy sometimes for a lot of people because there's this very radiant being up there leading the class who is offering kind of psychotherapeutic feeling advice or insight. And so it's not uncommon for yoga teachers like this to develop this guru status with their students, either, you know, unintentionally or intentionally, right? Um, 
you're, you have a wide audience, you have a, a, a huge audience as a popular yoga teacher, and you're going, doing some deep stuff with people, you're getting them into their bodies where our emotions and trauma live. And so people are getting really vulnerable in yoga classes. And so it's not uncommon. It's happened to me as a yoga teacher, and it's happened to many other teachers I know for a yoga student who's in this very vulnerable place to come up to the teacher after class when everybody else is cleared out, or maybe even other people are still there. And this yoga student will want to offer gratitude for the class. And before you know it, the student might have spilled all or half or all of their trauma narrative to the yoga teacher. Because a lot of the times in the aftermath of trauma, people don't have the best boundaries or the ability to, to contain uh, because their own boundaries were violated. If I can interrupt for a second, I just, sure. I want to say that when someone's trauma narrative has started, you don't always know that that's what's mm-hmm. happening. But yeah. for the person, it's almost like they have to say it all before they can stop. And, right. and they're really not feeling in control of what they're saying, but they're mm-hmm. just almost like in a trance of just... Mm-hmm. So that means their trauma has been activated. Yes, you're right. And so yoga can really activate one's trauma. I mean, there's a reason why we might use it in a very ethical and educated, intelligent way in a therapy session, because it does help to bring up what does need to be discharged and released. Mm -hmm. But, you know, yoga teachers aren't licensed mental health professionals. So, and yoga teachers find themselves in this situation sometimes where they've just gotten someone's trauma narrative um, all of a sudden. And now what do they do with that? You know, and, you know, uh, yoga teachers really want to help other people typically, like that's why they do it, you know, and they're really good at helping others. And, and that's why they're so good at, at their craft, but to try to offer counseling to a person right then and there on the spot would be um, a very possible way to re to support someone's Mm re-traumatization so so that's where I was going with that right because if you don't have the the education and the therapy the specific trauma therapy training and the licensure that actually protects the client to do counseling You know, it's not the place to then do counseling in a public yoga studio in a room where there's other people around and, you know, someone's already activated. So, you know, that's why I feel like I feel like all yoga teachers really need to have trauma informed training because it's just way too common. Trauma is just so prevalent and yoga brings up vulnerability in the body. You know, so I always recommend yoga teachers know mental health professionals in their area, especially therapists who specialize in trauma and have business cards on hand so that they can refer out, you know. And one of the things I talk about in the training I lead in working with yoga teachers is how to identify when somebody is activated. You know, again, it's recognizing the signs and symptoms and that they are kind of in that dissociated state sharing their trauma narrative. How do you gently interrupt them without invalidating them and get them to contain what's coming up so that you can resist re-traumatization most effectively? Yeah, that's a skill that I'm sure it takes being in a training like yours to be able to develop because you have Mm -hmm. to remain compassionate, grounded yourself. And, Mm -hmm. you know, also you in a way you're protecting the person from what they don't see is happening in that moment, you know, the best you can. Definitely. Yeah. You know, and I remember when I was a new clinician, this came up. Um, just in a training I did, or it might have been in supervision where, you know, we were talking about how the trauma narrative can just fill out, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. and sometimes people will actually go home after spilling like that and say that they felt a sense of relief Mm -hmm. until moments later or the next day or whatever, where they feel so raw, cracked, open and vulnerable, that then things like suicidal ideation start Mm -hmm. to show up or 
triggers to go get high start to show up. Right? Cutting, like promiscuity cutting, exactly. that they wouldn't yeah. do otherwise. Mm-hmm, exactly. Right. Because we know as trauma therapists, there's a very structured, safe way that we have people approach the trauma and we're never, I don't know any trauma therapy where we're inviting people to relive it, right? We might be allowing pieces of the trauma to come into the present moment and always have that knowledge that we're in the present, but we never are encouraging clients to relive the past, you know, but in that dissociative state, that's what's happening. Right. And so for the clinician who is working for working with the client who is not within their window of tolerance, as Dan Siegel Mm -hmm. talks about, you know, and their, their trauma is activated. And of course, if it comes up, you know, it comes up and you, you have Mm -hmm. to help the person be resourced and contain what's happening so that they are not being re-traumatized, but to, you know, to try to do trauma work with them in that when they're outside of their window of tolerance is, is potentially harmful and re-traumatizing. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Like in clinical settings, if I have a new client who's coming in, you know, and they're coming in for their trauma, I encourage them over and over again. I remind them, you know, that we're not going to go in depth and sometimes they want to because they'll say, no, like it happened three years ago. I'm totally over. It. I can talk about it now. Mm-hmm. But they're also here because they're having flashbacks. So clearly, right. no, it's not over. Right. So I'm always just embodying compassion and acceptance to the best of my ability. But again and again, encouraging people not to get to the details. Like we'll get to the details eventually, perhaps, depending on which, you know, treatment approach we decide to take. But, you know, just give me the a general idea of when it happened, you know, very, very general sense of what happened. And then that's it. And then we're doing skills like containment, maybe sometimes breathing, grounding and mindfulness skills. That's first before we actually go into the narrative. And it also teaches people how to have boundaries around what they share, right? Which is which is challenging for probably most people, but also for the trauma survivor specifically. Well, especially when their trauma is activated and it doesn't feel like it's within their control to yeah. when to share it and when not to, because it's basically seeping out everywhere. For example, like with the flashbacks, mm-hmm. it's there all the time. and they're being, you know, constantly reminded. So they're basically kind of almost blurting it out because they really need someone to hear it. But that's a symptom of, you know, that their trauma is activated. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. There's one more thing I'd like to touch on about that, that I think I've probably said this before, and we may have even talked about it last time, but I'll just briefly say that I've heard trauma survivors describe this sense of urgency to let's do the trauma work. Come on, let's get into the trauma. I need to get into the trauma. I'm ready. I'm ready Mm -hmm. to do the trauma. I've been suffering for so long. I'm ready to let's get into the trauma. And it's this like urgency. Mm -hmm. And people have said, I thought this was a really good description that it feels like having your pedal to the floor in your car, like you're accelerating your pedals all the way down to the floor and your emergency breaks on. Like it's like this, Mm-hmm. out of control, got to go, you know, right. a thousand yeah. miles per hour. Meanwhile, this like, you know, stuckness at the same time. Right. Well, that parallels the traumatic experience right. wholeheartedly because, you know, it's like you go from fight or flight and then most trauma occurs. And this is the words of Bessel van der Kolk and Peter Levine, like most trauma occurs in immobilization. Mm -hmm. So it's like the gas pedal, the accelerator was pressed down. You were in fight or flight, but then you were forced to be immobile. So, I mean, that's what creates trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's get away. Right. You couldn't get away, but all those chemicals, like you, your body wanted you to run. The adrenaline was up. The amygdala was super active. Like you were ready to run, but you couldn't. So all of that energy becomes lodged in the in the connective tissue, disorganized in multiple parts of the brain, in the muscle, 
right? So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So that so that means that they're activated to a degree, right? Because they're they're stuck in that place of I'm frozen yet I gotta go. Right. Right. And it's yeah. like asking the therapist, take me there, you know, mm-hmm. and the therapist is wanting to help, but that's where our responsibility is to recognize the symptoms and clues and hints that they have, you know, that this is actually their trauma that's activated, that's making them want this and resist traumatization, re-traumatization, because we know that it's, that's what we have to do for, you know, ethical practice. Definitely. Most definitely. Yeah. And, you know, so with resist re-traumatization, so one is staying within your scope of practice. And we covered that a bit. And then another piece to resisting re-traumatization is doing your own work. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think anybody should be working with trauma survivors who hasn't done their own work. And I mean trauma work because we've all been traumatized to some degree, Mm -hmm. you know, and I kind of, I think I touched on this a little bit last time, but in a different way, you know, talking about how people try to meditate away their trauma <laughs> or like yoga away their, you know, depression or, you know, and, right. but what if your wounding happened, you know, in childhood, which for most of us, it, it did. None mm-hmm. of us had perfect childhood, you know, so the yoga gives you the ability to be calm to find peace within your body, to take a breath and breathe deeply. Yoga gives us good coping skills. Meditation uh, affords us the same thing, you know, and yoga and meditation are one and the same. But if you haven't ever explored your childhood, you know, at least once with a licensed mental health professional, if you haven't approached some of your past relational issues, you've got to do that before you go do any relational work, whether it be yoga, massage, acupuncture, psychotherapy, whatever, because we're vulnerable, our clients are vulnerable, and it's very, very easy to exploit other people and re-traumatize them. And we've seen it. We've seen it in the yoga world, and we've seen it in the therapy world over and over again, how people who are given this status of authority, whether it be the guru status or the you're the mental health professional and I'm the patient. We've seen it happen again and again. The exploitation happens. And then there's trauma within the clinical setting. Uh, and, you know, oh, that's just, that's just so heartbreaking. So yeah. Heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. So do your own work. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, and I, I will expand on that too, to say, do your own work and continue doing your own work. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. not just like, yeah, get that taken care of and get that out of the way. No, it's like (laughs) take care of and tend to what comes Mm -hmm. up with you in your role as a yoga teacher, in your role as a therapist, a massage therapist, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever it may be, because, you know, it's not like there's an end destination. You want to heal your trauma so that it's not flaring up, but relationally stuff is always happening. And, you know? Exactly. Yeah. You know, in the trainings that I lead, I'll give examples because uh, I feel like examples just really help mm-hmm. to illustrate. So I'll give examples of specific yoga teachers who were like famous yoga teachers who have sexually exploited their students, um, you know, and then there's always the residual judgment, right? Oh my gosh, I can't believe this person did this, you know, and I think that's how we tend to react a lot of the times to to recognize what we perceive to be the difference between us and the bad guy. Yeah. But really we're all more alike than we are different. That's right. So, and so I say, you know, if you think it couldn't happen to you, if you think you couldn't exploit somebody, that's when you're at the highest risk to, to do it because then you don't think you need to do the work. That's so that true of pre- everything. Prevent you from doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it's gotta be ongoing. I, Absolutely agree with you on that. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I wanted to talk about the the other the six principles of of trauma informed care, too. But we really won't have enough time to do that today. Yeah. So I will link to the list and I'll just go over it really quickly. Just the 
the main points Uh for people to consider. It's this is from SAMHSA, the um, Guiding Principles of Trauma Informed Care. And I'll link to this with also I'll link to the resource that Natita talked about. But it's safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support and mutual self-help, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice and cultural, historical, and gender issues. Maybe we can even come back to this again in a, another future episode, because as yeah. you said, we could talk about just one of them probably for three hours or three days. Right. <laughs> exactly. Because it's so... Three years. That's yeah. <laughs> right. It's so important and it's so yeah. complex and, mm-hmm. and deep, but crucial. Yeah, definitely. Yes. it's. I feel like we've got to be trauma informed, just everybody benefits from being trauma informed, no matter what field you're in, just as a human being, because we've all experienced trauma to some degree. And there's so much trauma happening in our world all the time. So yeah, right. That's that was that first R, um, I believe, where it was saying that recognizing the the prevalence of trauma, Mm -hmm. and how it impacts all of us all the time. Right. Definitely. Yeah. The broader impact. Yeah. And yeah, it's so, so prevalent. And again, like a lot of the statistics are for PTSD, like who's walking around with Mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress disorder. And to meet the criteria for PTSD, there's a whole bunch of criteria that, you know, and there's a certain time frame that Mm -hmm. criteria have to be met in. It's very, very specific. So there's a lot of people who have very active trauma that would really benefit from being resolved, but they just don't meet the So a lot of the statistics are just, I would say, almost irrelevant because like we're we're not including people who don't have PTSD but really are suffering all the same. Yes. People who yeah. are impacted by trauma but whose symptoms don't meet the criteria would still be suffering quite a bit. It's just basically mm-hmm. a numerical score on right. the on the assessment scale that, you know, you could have, if you're below that number, you don't have quote unquote PTSD, but if you, you know, it's, it's not a lot of difference in the symptoms. It's just kind of almost like a random line that they create. It's like, well, okay, we'll say Mm -hmm. it's higher than this. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And it's used, you know, for managed care purposes. So, I mean, it's, (laughs) <laughs> like if you're oh, yeah. having flashbacks, like, but you say that there are two out of four severity instead of four out of four flashbacks are a problem. It's not right. It's telling right. you that the trauma is not, it's activated. It's not settled. Right. Yeah. We want to get people embodied and help them thrive in their life and be able to make choices over uh, what's happening to their bodies instead of their bodies hijacking them. So who cares if it's a two or a four or whatever? Yeah, any flashback at all being drawn out of one's present moment experience is is not something anybody wants for their life. So Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, Natita, it's been wonderful talking with you again. And I feel like there's so much more to be said. I wish we had more time, but I believe that we will come back together again because... (laughs) You know, we're like really kind of, I think, in the same mindset. And I really enjoyed talking about this with you. Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, we both graduated from Old Dominion University. So I feel like it's just meant to be. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, it's always a pleasure talking with you, too. So we'll talk about it. Yeah, I'd love to, to come back and see what else we can explore together, potentially. But thank you for having me on again. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So real quick, if you'll just tell people where they can get more information on the trauma conscious yoga method and your trainings. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So they can find more information at traumaconsciousyoga.com. Awesome. Thanks so much for listening to my interview with Natita Gassell about trauma informed practice and scope of practice. I think this conversation is going to be coming up more in future episodes. So stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, I'd love to hear your feedback. Go to therapychatpodcast.com and you can leave me a message using SpeakPipe. Want to let you know that some upcoming episodes are going to include listener questions 
and my answers. So I'm excited to bring that to you. Thanks as always for listening to Therapy Chat. I welcome you to leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. Wherever you listen to your podcasts, it would be so helpful if you could subscribe or leave a rating and review or both. And there's always the Therapy Chat podcast app, which is free, available only on iTunes, so not for Android yet. But that's another way to get all your episodes of Therapy Chat in one place. Until next time, take care. Just another reminder that if you'd like to become a member of Therapy Chat, supporting the podcast while receiving fun member perks and being able to communicate with me one-on-one, go to patreon.com slash therapy chat. If every subscriber donated just $1 per month, therapy chat would be able to keep going strong indefinitely. Thanks so much for your support. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.